Well, it's nice to be back again. Today we're going to talk about a very complex issue. It's called the path of obedience and it's a health lecture, but it's a health lecture with a difference. It has some of the more controversial statements in the Spirit of Prophecy writings in it. And some of these statements today are being used to discredit the Spirit of Prophecy. And books of a new order are being written to that effect. And I know that most people, well, gloss over many of the statements that we're going to discuss and think that, you know what, they don't really apply to us. And uh, I know that many nice people and many good people think that this is not such a serious issue and why should we worry about it. And I'm not giving this lecture to condemn anyone because most of the people that do all of the things that are going to be in this lecture are friends of mine, colleagues of mine. And it's not the intention to condemn at all, but to place it in a framework of present truth and to see if it fits. If it fits, well, then we can wear it. And if it doesn't fit, well, then we can reject it. So seeing that there is so much controversy on the issue, why is it important and what do we do about it? Now, in the previous talk that we had, I spoke about the chemical aspects and the, the physical aspects of some of these things. So tonight I want to speak about more the spiritual aspects, but the two overlap, so it's not always easy to separate them. So what is the path? Of obedience. The path of obedience to God is the path of virtue, of health and happiness. The plan of salvation as revealed in the Holy Scriptures open up a way whereby man may secure happiness and prolong his days upon the earth as well as enjoy the favor of heaven and secure that future life which measures with the life of of God. The assurance of God's approval will promote physical health. That's a very interesting statement. It fortifies the soul against doubt, perplexity, excessive grief that so often sap the vital forces and induce nervous diseases of a most debilitating and distressing character. The Lord has pledged his unfailing word that his eye shall be over the righteous and his ear open to their prayer. I don't think anybody should have a problem with that because even in the natural world out there, we know that a good spirituality improves health. So there is nothing untoward about those statements. Now if we go to the beginning, and we reason from cause to effect and from the beginning to the end, then we should be able to discern a pattern in the scriptures and then perhaps pick up that same pattern in the spirit of prophecy and then see how it affects us and what it entails. Genesis 1.29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Now that's old English for food. When the King James uses meat, it means food. When it uses flesh, it means meat as we think of it today. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. So everything, according to this verse, in the beginning was vegetarian. Total plant-based diet. There's nothing there of an animal nature in the original diet. And then we read in Genesis chapter 3, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb. Some people pronounce it herb. 
of the field. Okay, so obviously when conditions deteriorated after the fall and the ground was cursed and didn't yield as it did before, vegetables were added. There's still no meat in this diet whatsoever. So that was the antediluvian diet post-sin. So you had a pre-fall and a post-fall diet. Now logically, when it comes to restoration of the original plan, where should we go to? To the original, isn't that so? But seeing that we're living in a world where the earth has been cursed, we're stuck with a diet of fruits, grains, nuts, seeds, and vegetables. That's the diet according to scripture. We read in the spirit of prophecy, God gave our first parents the food he designed that the race should eat. Sounds logical. It was contrary to his plan to have the life of any creature taken. There was no death in Eden. The fruit of the trees of the garden was the food, ma food man's once required. God gave man no permission to eat animal food until after the flood. Everything had been destroyed upon which man could subsist, and therefore the Lord, in their necessity, gave Noah permission to eat of the clean animals which he had taken with him into the ark. But animal food was not the most healthful article of food for man. Again, I can only say it's scriptural, it's logical, does make sense. After the flood, flood, the people ate largely of animal food. God saw that the ways of man were corrupt and that he was disposed to exalt, him, exalt himself proudly against his creator and to follow the inclinations of his own heart and he permitted that long-lived race to eat animal food to shorten their sinful lives. That sounds somewhat controversial. Soon after the flood, the race began to rapidly decrease in size and length of years. Well, if you read scripture, you'll see that post-flood, life expectancy suddenly halved. When you get to the time of Peleg, it halves again. By the time you get to Abraham, it's 180 years. By the time you get to Moses, it's 120 years. By the time you get to David, it's round about what we have in the best of societies today, 70 to 80. So obviously there has been a decline. Another statement, but the words of our teacher to us were, as man thinketh, so he is. The flesh of dead animals was not the original food for man. Man was permitted to eat it after the flood because all vegetation had been destroyed. But the curse pronounced upon man and the earth and every living thing had made strange and wonderful changes. Since the flood, the human race has been shortening its period of existence, physical, mental, and moral degeneracy is rapidly increasing in these latter days. So it seems as if there is a tendency to get worse and worse. And if I just look at my own lifetime, I can concur that there is a definite tendency to get worse and worse. Now let's have a look at science. This is the Journal of the American Medical Association. And have a look. Red meat consumption and mortality. Results from two prospective cohort studies, and there's a whole host of illustrious authors there. Conclusions. Red meat consumption is associated with an increased risk of total cardiovascular disease and cancer mortality. Substitution of other healthy protein sources for red meat is associated with a lower mortality risk. Meat is a major source of protein and fat in most diets. Substantial evidence from epidemiological studies shows that consumption of meat, particularly red meat, is associated with increased risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and certain cancers. Several studies also suggest an elevated risk of mortality associated with red meat intake. And they've actually isolated chemicals which seem to make this deterioration possible. 
lead to inflammation and also to shorten life expectancy. So biologically, those statements make sense. Study shows how meat spurs cancer growth. Natural news, like to eat meat? Consider the, this unappetizing truth. When you gulp down a nice juicy steak or a hamburger, you are contributing to tumor fueling inflammation in your body. In fact, eating a diet rich in red meat has long been linked to a host of ills, including several types of cancer. But what is it about meat consumption that could impact cancer growth? Now scientists at the University of California have found a mechanism that explains how re eating red meat as well as milk could spur the growth of malignancies. And this study was headed by a physician by the name of Farke and it suggests that inflammation is induced which results in these debilitating diseases. So science bears it out. And what is the recommendation of the modern scientific fraternity? What do they say? They say, well, here first his, uh, his curriculum vitae, as it were. It says in his research, they studied a non-human glycan or sugar molecule known as NEU5GC. Although this molecule is not produced naturally in the human body, it is incorporated into human tissues if you eat red meat. The body then develops antibodies against this substance and this immune response could potentially trigger a low-grade chronic inflammation spurring the growth of cancer. In a statement prepared for the media, they explained it has been recognized by scientists for some time that chronic, chronic inflammation can stimulate, stimulate cancer. And then their recommendation for anyone interested in reducing inflammation, stop eating meat and dairy products is their first recommendation. Science, not spirit of prophecy. Now, when you consider 120 years ago when those statements were written, exactly the opposite would have been what the media proclaims. So again, we have, we have this contrast between what is written in the spirit of prophecy and what the medical world of the time actually spoke about. It says, concentrate on a Mediterranean flavored style of eating with lots of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, olive oils, and nuts. <laughs> That sounds very biblical to me. Uh, these lower inflammation levels. Don't smoke, particularly secondhand smoke. Know your oils. Avoid all inflammation-causing trans fat, hydrogenated, partially hydrogenated oils, etc. And instead use inflammation-fighting omega-3s like flaxseed, canola oil, walnut in your diet. I mean, he could have quoted this straight out of the spirit of prophecy because it says the identical thing. Science bears up the spirit of prophecy. Lose weight if you need to. Research has shown that a waist that measures 40 inches in a man and over 35 inches in a woman is a sign of probable high inflammation. Don't skimp on sleep. De-stress, well, they suggest yoga or meditation or any forms of walking or exercise or any one of those. Well, let's call it spirituality. The recommendation of the modern scientific fraternity in scientific medical journals. Don't get much better than that. Here's another link. Who links, this is the World Health Organization, links processed meat consumption to cancer. Hot dogs, bacon, other processed meats raise the risk of colon, stomach, and other cancers, the World Health Organization said. So this is common knowledge, and yet people will rebel against the statements in the spirit of prophecy, which God actually, in my opinion, means for our good. Isaiah 11 verse 6 says, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed their young ones, shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. 
So the Bible predicts that in the future world we will return to the original diet. Now is it only a question of health? Because some vegetarians don't live much longer than non-vegetarians. And some vegans don't live any longer either than some others. And there are many factors that affect your health and your longevity. But what if it has an effect on the mind? Does that make a difference then? What if it has an effect on your discernment? Would that make a difference in terms of where we stand in determining right and wrong and where we are going in the streams of time? So maybe it's not just an issue of what I eat, but also how it affects my thinking. Isaiah 11 verse 11 says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and Egypt, from Patros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamat, and from the islands of the sea. And, <coughs> and he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. When was the first time he gathered his people? together, when he took them out of Egypt. And there will come a second time, just before the end, when God will again gather his people out of all nations. And we have to ask ourselves, biblically, how did he deal with the nations or with the children of Israel when he took them out the first time? And is there to be expected a parallel when he takes them out the second time? Isn't that a logical question? Well, let's have a look at the first time. Exodus 16, verse 2, And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. A very grumbly people. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. So was the diet that was given to the children of Israel a test of obedience, yes or no? Yes. Obviously. Now if you did that in the first gathering, can't we expect it in the second? So why shouldn't diet be a test of obedience in the second gathering as well? And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmuring which you murmur against him, and what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Did they like the manna that they received? They didn't have a problem with the manna, but they had the problems with the absence of flesh. They wanted something else with it. And so the Lord eventually relented, and he gave it to them, and he said, I will give it to you, and I will give it to you till it comes out of your ears, until it's loathsome to you. I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel speak unto them, saying, At even you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years until they came to a land inhabited, and they did eat manna until they came into the borders of the land of Canaan. We are now on our way to anti-typical Canaan. Deuteronomy says he humbled thee and he suffered thee to hunger and he fed thee manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Is there a connection between the spiritual and the physical here? I'm just quoting Bible now because people, you know, speak about the spirit of prophecy as though it is demented when it says 
the very same things that the scriptures say. So let's stick to the scripture first before we go to the other. And say unto the people, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow and you shall eat flesh. Excuse me. Sanctify yourself and you shall eat flesh. So is flesh now going to be good for them because they were to sanctify themselves? No, they were to sanctify themselves to resist that which was not good for them. For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt, therefore the Lord will give you flesh and you shall eat. And you shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty days, but even a whole month until it come out of your nostrils and be loathsome unto you. So were they being sanctified because they were going to enjoy it? Obviously not. Because that you have despised the Lord which is among you and have wept before him saying, why came we forth out of Egypt? The scripture is very clear. God was not pleased when he led a people back to an original form of eating and they required another one. And the people spake against God and against Moses, wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness, for there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loathes this light bread. And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day, and they gathered the quails. He that gathered least gathered ten homers, and they spread them all abroad for themselves around about the camp. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed. The wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. And he called the name of that plague Kibrat Hatava, graves of the longing because they buried the people that lusted. Right, analysis of scripture. God wanted to sanctify them so that they could enjoy the meat, right? Obviously not sanctify themselves so that they could resist it. And those that were gluttonous and grabbed it and stuck it between their teeth, while they still were shoving it in, the wrath of God was kindled against them. This is scripture, not spirit of prophecy. So let's go to patriarchs and prophets. During this period of waiting, there was a time for them to meditate upon the law of God, which they had heard, and to prepare their hearts to receive the further revelation that he might make to them. They had none too much time for this work, and had they been thus seeking a clearer understanding of God's requirements and humbling their hearts before him, they would have been shielded from temptation. Does this sound logical? This is now the supposed false prophet speaking. But they did not do this, and they soon became careless, inattentive, and lawless. Especially was this the case with the mixed multitude. And they were impatient to be on their way to the land of promise and the land flowing with milk and honey. It was only on condition of obedience that a goodly land was promised them. But they had lost sight of this. There were some who suggested a return to Egypt. But whether forward to Canaan or backward to Egypt, the masses of the people were determined to wait no longer for Moses. And if we look there in the Psalms, well, firstly, let's see how much they gathered. They were so gluttonous for meat that the least they gathered was 10 homers. Now, one homer is 220 liters. So that's 2,200 liters of flesh or 80 to 100 bushels, that's a number of bathfuls of flesh. That's how much they gathered. And the psalm says they tempted God in their heart by asking for meat for their lust, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert, and he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. What does that mean? What is a leanness in the soul other than a loss of discernment? So there is a loss of discernment when you eat that which God said is not the best for you. And that is the most dangerous thing for God's people. When we lose discernment and we cannot distinguish right from wrong anymore and wrong appears to look right, then we are in trouble. 
then we are in deep, deep trouble. Health reform was to be a blessing. Psalms 105 verse 37, he brought them forth also with silver and gold and there was not one feeble person amongst any of their tribes. The light that God has given and will continue to give on the food question is to be to his people today what the manna was to the children of Israel. In other words, the test that existed then will come again at the end. And we just read that scripture previously. I will reach out my hand a second time to gather the children. And I can assume that the way in which, which God deals with his children will be similar. Because God is not wavering. God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why should he have a different way of dealing with it? Now, the children of Israel were permitted to go back to their ways once the typology was enacted. But typologically, throughout the scriptures, there are examples when God shows quite clearly that nothing has changed. And when you look at the word Daniel, people of judgment, End time people, what was Daniel doing? How was he living? He was an example of those that would be living in the end. So the whole nation was a type in the walk through the wilderness. Then individuals became the types, the Daniels and the John the Baptists. They became the types for the end. And in the end, you will have another gathering and then you will have the same experience on another level that uh, the children of Israel had. Now the character of Daniel is presented to the world as a striking example of what God's grace can make of men fallen by nature and corrupted by sin. The record of his noble self-denying life is an encouragement to our common humanity. From it we may gather strength to nobly resist temptation and firmly and in the grace of meekness stand for right under the severest trials. Those who make the most of their opportunities, who place themselves in right relation with God, will be rewarded even as was Daniel. We read of him that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portions of the king's meat, food nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested that the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, for why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? What? You want to eat vegetarian food? You're going to look sickly. Uh, do we hear the same noise today? Doesn't the whole world say that? A vegetarian is a weed. That's what they think. He looks like a carrot with a sprig of parsley in his nose. Prove thy servant, I beseech thee ten days, Daniel said. Let them give us pulse, that's plant food, and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And then you, deal, then you look for yourself. And if we look worse, well, fine. But if we look better, then give us what we ask for. Now, we've proved this many times in our life. We've had people who have been devastated by disease and were looking like children of Biafra sitting at our table. And... Ten days later, there was a total change. Ten days can and will do it. Now some will say, yes, but Daniel was only a vegetarian when uh, he fasted. Otherwise, he was not a vegetarian. What do we read in Youth Instructor? And now as Daniel and his fellows were brought to the test, they placed themselves fully on the side of righteousness and truth. They did not move capriciously, but intelligently. They decided that as flesh meat had not composed their diet in the past, 
Why would the young man say to the prince of the eunuchs, give us pulse? Was he on a diet? No, it was his lifestyle, obviously. It should not come into their diet in the future. And as wine had been prohibited to all who should engage in the service of God, they determined that they would not partake of it. Now today people say, well, the people drank wine in the old days. People have been drinking wine all the time. Were the priests allowed to drink it? And aren't the end time people regarded as priests of God? So that alone should settle the matter. So yes, he was a vegetarian. And John the Baptist? For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Now, they say, Jesus ate fish. Jesus ate lamb. Jesus ate with the publicans. Jesus did all of these things. Are you saying that I can't do these things? Was there a pro prohibition even in the time of Jesus for someone not to do it? Obviously. John the Baptist came, not eating and drinking. Jesus came, eating and drinking. Now this sounds very strange. Did Jesus eat unclean meat? Obviously not. Why not? Because the Bible prohibited it and he wouldn't go against it. Would he drink fermented wine? No, of course not. It would inebriate his brain. Did the devil have anything on him in terms of the law? No. So Jesus was very precise, but he met the people where they were at that stage. But he said, I long to lift you to a higher plane, but I cannot tell you because you will not be able to take it. So gently, 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 he introduced the truths that were necessary. And John the Baptist came not eating and drinking. All right. What did he eat? John separated himself from friends and from the luxuries of life, the simplicity of his dress, a garment woven of camel's hair was a standing rebuke to the extravagance and display of the Jewish priests. It was not a coarse, horrible garment. It was a normal one woven from cam camel's hair. That was quite a, a special garment, but it wasn't flashy with all those fancy, important robes. It was simple and it was effective. So it rebuked the extravagance and his diet, now the spirit of prophecy says, purely vegetable, excuse me, of locusts and wild honey. How do you bring those two together? Well, it wasn't locusts, it was locusta, the locust plant, which is the carob bean, which is the same one that is referred to that the man who ate with the swine later ate the pods and came to his senses. That's what the poor people ate. And it was frowned upon to eat this vegetarian food. But the first time the lost son came to his senses when he couldn't afford the luxuries and he had to eat simple food. His brain cleared up. And so he ate locusta and wild honey. Well, what is wild honey? It's actually plant-based food. It's just nectar transformed. So... In the end, the great subject of reform is to be agitated. And John the Baptist is a type of the Elijah message. And the Elijah message comes at the end. And so God's anti-typical John the Baptists, shouldn't they have a lifestyle of not eating and drinking what the world eats? Yes or no? So it's biblical. It's not only spirit of prophecy. In grains, fruits, vegetables, and nuts are to be found all the food elements that we need. If we will come to the Lord in simplicity of mind, he will teach us how to prepare wholesome food free from the taint of flesh meat. God is going to lead his people back to the original Eden diet. Are we going to have an enemy along the road? 
Are we going to have a mixed multitude in our midst that is going to scream blue murder and say, let's go back to the flesh pots of Egypt? Yes. Eight manuscripts released. Soon butter will never be recommended. At a time when this was the only food. Is butter recommended as a healthy food source today? Yes or no? No. If you have cardiovascular disease, avoid butter. Avoid butter. That's what the world says. And after a time, milk will be entirely discarded. For disease in animals is increasing in proportion to the increase of the wickedness amongst men. The time will come when there will be no safety in using eggs, milk, cream, or butter. What kind of diet does that sound like? That's a vegan vegetarian diet, whether we like it or not. You can protest and do whatever you like. But that's what the original diet was, and it says we're going back there. Here's another quote. The light given me is that it will not be very long before we shall have to give up using any animal food. That's plain enough. Even milk will have to be discarded. Disease is accumulating rapidly. The curse of God is upon the earth because man has cursed it. The habits and practices of men have brought the earth into such a condition that some other food than animal food must be substituted for the human family. We do not need flesh food at all. God can give us something else. You're so blessed in this country, you can walk into any supermarket and get everything straight off the shelf. You want cheese? Can I have vegan cheese? Yes, here. Yeah. Pleasure. Vegan cheese. Can I have vegan meat? Yes, here's vegan meat. You can get everything you want. There's no excuse in this world because God has given something else and he's given culinary skill in order to do it. There is no safety in the eating of the flesh of dead animals and in a short time the milk of cows will be excluded from the diet of God's commandment keeping people. In a short time it will not be safe. This was written in 1901. In a short time, it will not be safe to use anything that comes from the animal creation. Now, spirit of prophecy, are you insane? Are you fanatical? Uh, do people adhere to it? Some do. Do most? No. Most of them don't. Do the ministers set an example? Most of them don't. If milk is used, it should be thoroughly sterilized. With this precaution, there is less danger of contracting disease from its use. Butter is less harmful when eaten on cold bread than when used in cooking. I mean, how could this person have known this when there was no evidence of what happens when fats are oxidized when heating? How freed radicals are formed? This is such sound advice that the modern fraternity has only caught up with it in recent times. There is no way that you can say that that is not a truthful statement. So, if you sterilize your milk, it's better. But what's still better? None. None. She says it quite plainly, it has to be given up. So some people say, okay, it's sterilized, I can drink it. The counsel is none. But as a rule, it is better to dispense with it altogether. Cheese is still more objectionable. It is wholly unfit for food. In fact, it should never be introduced into the stomach. Everybody knows that it takes hours and hours and hours to digest it and that the casein is highly allergenic and causes many of the sclerotic diseases in the world today. It's totally unfit for food. You cannot live too plainly. When you are studying so constantly, your father and I, in other words, James White was still alive when she wrote this, have dropped milk, cream, butter, sugar, and meat entirely since we came to California. We are far clearer in mind and far better in body. We live very plainly. We cannot write unless we live simply. Health reform is progressive. You cannot take a statement from the beginning where she says, use good milk and use good eggs and use good this and use good that in the place of eating all that meat. You cannot use that if health reform is progressive 
and compare it to an end statement which says the time is coming when you have to give it up. And she even says, I've given it all up because the time is here. There is a, there is a way to deal with it. You can easily take something out of context and says, oh, look here. Here she writes, don't argue when people say you should not eat pork. Who gave you this message? There was no health reform message at that time. So health reform is progressive. And then same with, with the children of Israel. God had to reintroduce his health message through Moses before they came to their senses. So this is the counsel that we have for the time we are living in right now. We cannot now do as we have ventured to do in the past. It's progressive in regard to meat eating. It has always been a curse to the human family, but now it is made particularly so in the curse which God has pronounced upon the herds of the fields because of the man's transgression and sin. The disease upon animals is becoming more and more common, and our only safety now is in leaving meat entirely alone. Well, excuse me, doesn't that apply to milk then as well and to eggs? What does the scientific fraternity say? Animal diseases on the rise due to climate change warns industry. They'll find any excuse why it's on the rise. So forget about their idiosyncrasies. The fact of the matter is animal disease is on the increase. When's this article? December 2015. Animal disease on the increase. They say it's global warming. No, it's sin. Uh, then he talks about the various problems. Schmalberger virus, considered to have come from Africa, is now a disease that is appearing and uh, it's affecting milk production, malformation in newborns. And according to the European Center of Disease Prevention and Control, in April 2012, the total number of SPV infected herds was 3,444. You want to take your pick amongst those? Is disease increasing? Yes, these are diseases that didn't occur before. Here's another scientific article. Human death from animal diseases on the rise. Is disease increasing in proportion to the wickedness of man? An estimated 50 million people caught diseases from animals such as dogs, cattle, chickens, mosquitoes between 2000 and 2005. According to a new study, 78,000 of them died. The finding reveals that the global urgency for doctors to stay vigilant when it comes to zoonotic diseases, animal to man, uh, by viewing past studies, virologists have found that the diseases responsible seem to be increasing. False profit or bang on? Bang on. So what are the most prominent zoonotic diseases? Some known ones are Lyme disease, rabies, Ebola, bubonic plague, HIV. Are those diseases that have been around all the time or are they increasing today? These are all virtually new. So what has happened? There are over 200 zoonotic diseases known today. They have transferred to humans from bats, rats, dogs, monkeys, and much more. In the old days, viruses were species-specific. Dog's flu was dog's flu. Cat flu was cat flu. Bird flu was bird flu. No longer. These become human diseases. Crossing the species barrier. These are brand new studies. Baylor University Medical Center. Avian influenza has recently been recognized as a new emerging infectious disease that may pose a threat to international public health. Most recent developments lead to the belief uh, that the virus could become the cause of the next influenza pandemic. Slaughterhouse, cattle burn, despair, consumers, death on the farm, suddenly foot and mouth disease virus becomes transpecific and jumps the species barrier and attacks human beings. Bird flu fears. 
Bird flu, Port Elizabeth, several ostriches in the Eastern Cape have died of bird flu. Also know of avian influenza virus. I mean, I lived in this area, they quarantined my road. The police were setting up roadblocks. And I went to them and said to them, they can come and sleep in our house, because why should they be cold all night? They can take turns sleeping in a nice bed. And uh, I chatted to them and I said, you know, you're looking for the flesh. What are you looking for? You're looking for ostriches? Yes. You're looking for pigs? Yes. Why are you looking for pigs? Uh, we can't tell you. I said, I'll tell you why. It's because of encephalitic virus, right? Uh, well, uh, uh. All right, they had 1918 flu that wiped out to a billion, up to a billion people. That was most of the population of the Earth of those days almost half, they said that jumped from the one to the other, and we're expecting the same thing very soon. Asia sickens, a time special report on avian flu outbreak. Eggs. Industry is introducing products into the eggs, or feeding the animals to so-called boost the protein uh, measurements that are made to increase the prices of these products. And Mankind is being poisoned with all kinds of diseases. Here's another one from February 26, 2016. Like its close relative in the West, Nile virus, Japanese encephalitis virus spread via the mosquitoes. Bloodsuckers snacking on sick birds and pigs pick up the pathogen and pass it on to their next meal. Is disease increasing? Why would you want to eat these things? if disease is increasing in proportion to the wickedness of man. Los Angeles Times, Cairo, 16 people in Egypt have died of the H1N1 virus and uh, spreading across Africa and the north. Deadly eggs, all kinds of uh, infectious elements and bacteria like salmonella, and all of these in Campylobacter. And then, of course, you have the whole problem of pollution. And as you go up the food chain, you find that there is a dreadful concentration of products until you get to the top level. So if you want to know why all the seals are dying in the world today, in their hundreds and washing up dead, it's because they're accumulating the toxins, especially TBT and others like it, in their flesh. And uh, we have signs, contaminated fish. But even the Inuits in Canada and the North have high levels of PCB in their blood as a consequence of eating fish that is caught right up there in the North where there are no pollutants. So yes, disease is increasing. Not even to speak about BSE, which affects even young children. Flesh was never the best food, but its use is now doubly objectionable. Since disease in animals is so rapidly increasing, those who use flesh foods little know what they are eating. Often if they could see the animals when living and now the quality of the meat they eat, they would turn from it with loathing. People are continually eating flesh that is filled with tuberculosis and cancerous germs, Tuberculosis, cancer, and other fatal diseases are thus communicated. They laughed at these statements. They thought they were ridiculous. How can an old lady speak such nonsense? If milk is used, it should be thoroughly sterilized. It will be less dangerous. Cheese should not be introduced. We've read that. Soon it will never be recommended. Butter, because of the increase in disease. These are the milk-associated diseases, chronic fatigue syndrome, tension headaches, musculoskeletal pain, hyperactivity, bedwetting, allergies and congestion, asthma, early arteriosclerosis, juvenile diabetes, acne, rheumatoid arthritis, prostate cancer, hyperplasia, neuralgic diseases, Gehrig disease, multiple sclerosis, all associated with milk, all in the literature. So was she insane? Or are these just facts? The light given me is that it will not be very long before we shall have to give up using any animal food. Even milk will have to be discarded. Does it sound illogical?
or does it sound bang on? Now, is that the only problem? In a short time, the milk of cows will be excluded from God's commandment-keeping people. It will not be safe to use anything that comes from the animal product. We've dropped milk, etc. So, let's have a look at discernment. And this is the crux of the matter. We saw biblically that they had to sanctify themselves. And if they were gluttonous, while the meat was still between their teeth, they were struck and there was a leanness in their soul. They had lost something in their mind. So what does the spirit of prophecy have to say? Now I'm getting into hot water. Let not any of our ministers set an evil example in the eating of flesh meat. Let them and their families live up to the light of health reform. Let not our ministers animalize their own nature and the nature of their children. Children whose desires have not been restrained are tempted not only to indulge in the common habits of intemperance, but to give loose rein to their lower passions and to disregard purity and virtue. These are led on by Satan not only to corrupt their own bodies, but to whisper their evil communication to others. If parents are blinded by sin, they will often fail of discerning these things. Here's a spiritual element. This becomes fascinating. Let our ministers and canvassers step under the banner of strict temperance. Never be ashamed to say, no, thank you, I do not eat meat. I have conscientious scruples against eating the flesh of dead animals. If tea is offered, refuse it. Oops. Giving your reason for so doing, explain that it is harmful. And though stimulating for a time, the stimulus soon wears off and a corresponding depression is felt. Did you see that? Now we discussed that last time. Remember the hypoglycemic effects and why the depression sets in and all of those issues? And then this terrible statement. Can we possibly have confidence in ministers who at tables where flesh is served join with others in eating it? So it affects the discernment. Now I'm not saying watch your brethren and become policemen. Please don't get me wrong. This is counsel for anyone and you can choose to accept it or you can choose to reject it. It's not being judgmental. It's showing the facts upon which everyone can then base their decision. The interests of the cause of God are not to be committed to men who have no connection with heaven. Those who are disloyal to God cannot be safe counsellors. They have not that wisdom which comes from above. They are not to be trusted to pass judgment in matters connected with God's cause. Matters upon which such great results depend. If we follow their judgment, we shall surely be brought into very difficult places and shall retard the work of God. When you start eating like the world, you start thinking like the world. You start discerning like the world. You cannot discern the difference between right and wrong any longer. And you run into trouble. Some ministers have little interest in health reform because it opposes their self-indulgence. Why do some of our minister, ministering brethren manifest so little interest in health reform? It is because instruction on temperance in all things is opposed to their practice of self-indulgence. In some places, this has been the great stumbling block in the way of our bringing the people to investigate and practice and teach health reform. No man, this is very serious, should be set apart as a teacher of the people while his own teaching or example contradicts the testimony God has given his servants to bear in regard to diet. For this will bring confusion. His disregard of health reform unfits him to stand as the Lord's messenger. That's tough. In my own country, I know only of a handful of ministers who don't eat meat. Can we wonder why we have such confusion in our ranks with every wind of doctrine blowing and everybody accusing everyone else and the fisticuffs are becoming more and more and more because as you get entrenched 
into your way of thinking, you cannot even imagine that the other one might be different because of another perspective which you don't even realize. What then? They visited with their brethren at the table, revealed their principles by eating meat and drinking tea and coffee. And they would make some remark in regard to their not being so straight-laced as some of their brethren and sisters. These men were not making that progress in divine things that should make them safe teachers. So if you want to determine what's right and wrong, it doesn't mean that you go to every vegetarian and see he must have sense because oh no, the New Age world also eats like this. You have to have a spiritual connection and it has to be biblically based and you have to be sure that that person is in prayer and speaking to God and then you will understand that there is a difference between that what the world says and that which God says. It has to be based on Bible principles. Butter Cheese, flesh, meats of dead animals. Now the list gets worse. Oops. Rich cake, poor cookery, create disease and will certainly corrupt the blood and bring disease and suffering and pervert the discernment. It's all about the mind. Now in the last lecture we discussed the chemistry <coughs> and we discussed the components in tea and in coffee we looked at caffeine, we looked at theobromine, we looked at theophylline, we looked at the chemical composition and we said what it does in the biochemistry. I'm not going to go into the biochemistry tonight. I'm going to look at it from a totally different aspect. Your discernment will be affected. I beseech our people to consider that health reform is essential and that which we place in our stomachs should be the simple nourishment of good plainly prepared bread, fruit, grains. What does the world say? Don't eat bread, it's full of gluten. Don't eat it. There's a lot of religion in a good bread. But what do we eat? We eat refined bread. Okay, we'll eat bread. We'll buy it off the shelf. All refined. Hypoglycemic. No discernment whatsoever. You're all hyperactive one moment and totally lethargic the next. You oscillate between violence and deep depression. And you think, that that's just the sign of the times. Ignorance is no excuse now for the transgression of law. The light shines clearly and none need be ignorant for the great God himself is man's instructor. All are bound by the most sacred obligations to heed the sound philosophy and genuine experience which God is now giving them in reference to health reform. He designs that the subject shall be agitated. You're being judgmental. Why are you doing this? Why are you constantly preaching about this kind of thing? Can't you be quiet? It's got nothing to do with you. The subject must be agitated. I have no right to go and attack someone for what is on his plate, but I certainly have the right to explain to him why it is bad, and if he tells me to get lost, fine, I've done my job. I don't have to go to him every day and say, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. But if I want to have discernment and I'm dealing with ministry, well then it becomes a serious issue and it's a different matter entirely. All are bound by the most sacred obligation to heed the sound philosophy and genuine experience which God is now giving them in reference to health reform. He designs that the subject shall be agitated and the public mind deeply stirred to investigate it. For it is, this is thunderous, it is impossible for men and women, while under the power of sinful, health-destroying, brain enerviating habits, to appreciate sacred truth. This is deadly. You cannot distinguish truth when you don't have a right mind as a consequence of what you are eating. And therefore, truth seems foolishness to you. So when Jesus healed somebody, didn't he heal the physical as well as the mental? Always they go hand in hand. Now this statement has been used by modern writers to discredit the spirit of prophecy. And it's written in the modern books that are appearing or have just appeared in the press as to why this is a false prophet. You place upon your tables butter, 
Look at the list, it's fascinating. You place upon your tables butter, eggs, and meat, and your children partake of them. They are fed of the very things that will excite their animal passions, and then you come to the meeting and ask God to bless and save your children. How high do you think your prayers go? You have a work to do first. Oops. And they will say, well, with such a fanatical statement, this must be a false prophet. Did God not say, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow I will? And didn't the plague strike those who shoved it into their mouths before it was even chewed? So what is so wrong with this statement? Or have the people who are writing these things against the spirit of prophecy lost their discernment? For whatever reason, I cannot judge. Maybe they drink coffee and they have these spikes in their mind which determine their discernment. Maybe they do other things. Maybe they consume theobromine in great quantities, chocolates and all of these things. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is there's nothing unbiblical about that statement. And then this thunderous statement. At this stage of the earth's history, meat-eating is dishonoring to God. And I think that should make everyone sit upright. If meat-eating was dishonoring to God in the time of the Exodus, then isn't it dishonoring to God in the antitypical anti Exodus and our way to Canaan? Surely it must be. Is it the prophet that is wrong? Or is it the mind that is wrong? Now let's have a look at some of these statements. <laughs> and I know that they sound harsh. And people say, is this insanity? Tobacco, a subtle poison. Tobacco using is a habit which frequently affects the nervous system. We're talking about the mind. Because, brothers and sisters, this is a battle for the mind. In a most powerful manner, even more powerful than the use of alcohol, it binds the victim in stronger bands of slavery than does the intoxicating cup. The habit is more difficult to overcome. Body and mind are in many cases more thoroughly intoxicated with the use of tobacco than with spiritual liquors, for it is more subtle poison. This in a time when the scientific fraternity was proclaiming the wonder drug of cigarettes, the cure of all lung diseases, and the medical world was prescribing it. But it gets worse. This is a moral statement. Future generations would be ennobled or debased by their course of action they would have taken their stand that they could not unite their life interest with men who were cherishing unnatural appetites for alcoholic drinks, tobacco, which is a slow but sure and deadly poison, weakening the nervous system, debasing the noble faculties of the mind. If men would remain wedded to these vile habits, women should have left them to their life of self-blessed, single blessedness, to enjoy their companions of their choice. Women should not have considered themselves of so little value as to unite their destiny with men who had no control over their appetites, but whose principal happiness consisted in eating and drinking and gratifying their animal passions. In those days, women didn't smoke. Today, the women smoke and the men try to give up. Has the world gone insane? Women and children suffer from having to breathe the atmosphere that has been polluted by the pipe, the cigar, or the foul breath of the tobacco user. Those who live in this atmosphere are always ailing. As I have seen men who claim to enjoy the blessing of entire satisfaction, while they were slaves to tobacco, spitting and defiling everything around them, I have thought, how would heaven appear with tobacco users in it? The lips that were taking the precious name of Christ were defiled by tobacco spittle. The breath was polluted with a stench and even the linen was defiled. The soul that loved this uncleanness and enjoyed this poisonous atmosphere must also be defiled. The sign was hung upon the outside testifying of what was within. 
Do you think this is a very popular prophetic statement? Or would the world regard it as insane? Right, we've looked at some of the things. We've looked at meat. Is the meat industry one of the largest industries in the world? Yes. We've looked at tea in the previous lectures. We've looked at coffee. We looked at alcohol only fleetingly. We now looked at the statements on tobacco and discernment. Do you think that the enemy of God would want to introduce exactly these things into the world? So where do we find the root of these evils and where do they come from? Now we are often accused of being straight singular extremists because we believe that we shouldn't smoke, we shouldn't drink, and we should cut out all of these things. And we believe the Protestant principles that the Protestant world believe, namely that the teachings of Rome were the teachings of the Antichrist. All Protestants believed that. And here is a message for the last day people saying, separate yourself from the world and do these things. That's what the Spirit of Prophecy says. Will we find a similar message with the Antichrist or will we find the opposite message with the Antichrist? What is your discernment on this matter? If the Protestants were right, then we should find the opposite on the other side. Let's determine whether it is so. Here is the Catholic World Report. This is a Roman Catholic publication. A History of Catholicism and Tobacco. And I quote, Ex fumo dare le sem. At the time, just after the Spanish explorers were introduced to tobacco by way of Columbus's voyages, smoking or snuffing it, as the New World natives did, carried it with something of an air of deviltry, because natives saw in it connection to invisible spirits. Tobacco was used to create a contact with the spirit world by the pagans. It was used for spiritism. It was a tool in the hands of the devil. What did Rome do with it then? To some of the most earnest missionary clergy, the wreaths of its smoke and its action upon the spirits of those who imbibed it were a kind of sacramental parody of the church's sacraments, established in the new world beforehand by the devil in order to hinder its evangelization. So even Rome admits that this weed was from the devil. What did they do with it? Pope Benedict. Although Benedict VIII, a snuff-taker himself, reinforced the necessity to keep tobacco away from the altar and the tabernacle, in 1725 he evoked the penalty of excommunication for smoking in St. Peter's because he recognized that churchgoers were frequently slipping out of mass for a while to catch a smoke or a snuff. This is a Roman Catholic publication from their own pen. And he had decided it better for them to stay inside and not disrupt or disturb the liturgy or miss part of it. The Pope's nose. Benedict the 14th was also a snuff taker. He said to a once he said to have once offered his snuff box to the head of some religious order who declined to take a pinch of snuff saying your holiness I do not have that vice to which the Pope replied, it is not a vice, if it were a vice, you would have it. So it was no longer a vice because the Pope was using it. Pope Pius IX was an inveterate snuff taker and was so effusive and constant in it that he often had to change his long white sutan a few times a day. Did the spirit of prophecy say that even the linen was fouled by it? Yes. It was white after all and the snuff dust would settle on it. 
He offered snuff and snuff boxes to visitors and the church had established a monopoly on the tobacco trade in the Papal States. And in 1863, isn't it fascinating, just in time for the 1844 period when God receives, gives a message to his people, stay away from these things, the Church of Rome says, go for it and we'll control the industry. During his pontificate, consolidated its tobacco processing operations under the pontifical director of salt and tobacco in a newly erected building in the Piazza Mastai in Rome. So the one introduces it, having known that they call it the devil's weed, and the other one warns against it. Choose you which one is the false prophet. Jesuit snuff. Jesuit snuff? In the 16th and 17th centuries, the Jesuits developed a large tobacco plantations in the Central and South America and held financial interests in retaining revenues from them. The Dominicans, the Franciscans, the Augustinians had similar arrangements in Central America. During this time, the Jesuits, fond of their snuff, were accused by their Protestant and secular opponents without any evidence that they were trying to poison the Protestants with this material. Anyway, it finally, snuff was captured from Spanish ships and by 1702 by English Admiral Thomas Hobson and found their way into the British market. These vices are, have been prepared to becloud the discernment of the end time people on this planet. One warns, the other one introduces. At the same time, Jesuit missionaries introduced the snuff they loved to China's capital during the Manchu dynasty about 1715. For some time, Chinese converts to Catholicism were called snuff takers by their countrymen and handled the manufacture and selling of snuff in Beijing. Many Tibetan Buddhist monks are still quite fond of the snuff. Okay. And here we see the Pope smoking as he speaks with these block leaders who are atheists and the cardinals enjoying a smoke and making it popular and spreading this weed across the world. Now how do you make something like this popular? By introducing it into Jesuit theater, which is Hollywood, and all the movies. And if you remember the movies, was there ever a movie star that did not smoke to bring this weed to the forefront? What about the modern alcohol industry? Where does that come from? Isn't it from the Catholic Church? Wasn't it the friars that brewed the first beers? Wasn't it the friars that distilled the spirits that we have today and founded the great liquor industries of the day? So who's responsible for spreading these mind-debilitating drugs which have caused so much death and horror in the world? Rome. Rome is responsible. Here you can see the pictures. Monk testing wine, monk brewing beer. What about tea, coffee and cocoa? Surely those fall, don't fall into that category. Now, I'm not going to go into the science because I did it in the last lecture. You can look it up there. Food for Thought is the name of the lecture. And let's see what the spirit of prophecy has to say about it. Tea and coffee drinking is a sin. I go to churches, even in our own ranks, where there's a coffee bar at the entrance and you get a cup of coffee when you come in and after the service you all drink coffee. And they're surprised when you don't want to partake and they think you've gone insane. Can't they read? Or do they think that the spirit of prophecy is a joke? Tea and coffee drinking is a sin. An injurious indulgence which like other evils injures the soul. Did the meat? send a leanness into the soul? Well, tea and coffee drinking send a leanness into the soul, into the mind, into your discernment. These darling idols create an excitement, a morbid action of the nervous system. Those who indulge a perverted appetite do it to the injury of health and intellect. 
they cannot appreciate the value of spiritual things. If you want to drink coffee, you will lose your discernment. You will not be able to distinguish between right and wrong as readily as when you don't. Now I know many people will be angry with me, but I'm just saying this is what the spirit of prophecy says. What do you think the Roman Catholic Church will say on the issue? Well, if it is the Antichrist, then it must say exactly the opposite, right? If it is not the Antichrist, well, then it must say exactly the same or something similar. Spirit of Prophecy writes, you become less susceptible to the Holy Spirit's influence. To a user of stimulants, everything seems insipid without the darling indulgence. This deadens the natural sensibilities of both body and mind and renders him less susceptible to the influence of the Holy Spirit. In the absence of usual stimulants, he has a hungering of body and soul, not for righteousness, not for holiness, not for God's presence, but for his cherished idol. In the indulgence of hurtful lust, professed Christians are daily enfeebling their powers, making it impossible this is scary to glorify God. They cannot reflect God's character. And when they say they see nothing wrong with it, it is because they are so blunted that they cannot discern the difference between right and wrong. Now, who introduced the coffee bean into the world? Well, let's find out from history. Blessed bean, how the Pope baptized coffee. I love coffee, and there are a few things I a few things I enjoy more than a rich cup of blessed brew. But my affection for this drink goes beyond preference and borders on necessity. For when the alarm goes off and I pry myself out of bed each morning, coffee is the only thing that I get that can restore my humanity and keep me from drifting gently back into sleep in my chair, writes the author of thecatholicgentleman.net, talking about Catholicism and the history of Catholicism. But did you know that the popularity of coffee in the West is largely due to Pope Clement VIII and the year 1536 to 1605? Isn't that marvelous? Just in time, coffee arrives to destroy discernment on the points of the Reformation. The timing is always excellent. When coffee was first brought to the Christian Europe, it was greeted with a great deal of suspicion since it was the drink of the Muslim infidels with whom Christians had been at war for centuries. Some even went so far as to call this exotic beverage Satan's drink. This is from the Catholic webpage. Inevitably, coffee made its way to the Vatican where it was introduced to Pope Clement VIII. While many of his advisors clamored for the Pope to ban the controversial drink, he refused to do so before trying it himself. The Pope was brought a steaming mug of Java and took a sip. He was immediately delighted and according to legend he declared, the devil's drink is delicious. We should cheat the devil by baptizing it. So they know it's from the devil, but they baptize it. And the rest is history. Due to the papal blessing, coffee quickly spread throughout Europe and eventually the world where it remains a perennially popular drink. Choose ye this day the unpopular spirit of prophecy or the words of the Antichrist according to Reformation theology. Choose you this day. If you want to be with the one, fine. If you want to be with the other, Fine. The whole world wandered after the beast, received the mindset of the beast. Why? Because it eats and drinks like the beast and cannot discern any other way. Coffee was introduced from Ethiopia to the Arab world in the mid-14th century. Now let's see how it infiltrated the West. In 1650, it was introduced into Vienna, France 1660, London 1630, Germany 1675, the USA, 1696. Who introduced it? Who were the first to introduce it? The Pope blessed it, but who introduced it? 
Many aspects of coffee can be seen in the modern day lifestyle. By absolute volume, the United States is the greatest consumer. We don't have to read it all, it, how it came in through the various nations, etc., etc., and uh, then became a coffee society. So the papacy introduced coffee to the Western world just in time to destroy the minds of the people of the Reformation period. Now what about tea? Surely the Jesuits don't have anything to do with tea. Oh, come on. Can't be so. Or is it? History of black tea in China. This is an article on tea. Check it out. China is the birthplace of black tea, which is the one we spoke about and what it contains which in China is called perhaps more appropriately Hong Cha, red tea, after its red-colored tea is usually produced. Its history in China can be traced back to the late Ming Dynasty, around 1590, when the first black tea was produced. History of black tea development in England. This is the country that drinks the most tea. By the way, which country spearheaded the Reformation and the spread of Reformation theology throughout the world? Great Britain. The Germans thought it out, the Britons disseminated it. History of black tea development in England. The British are renowned worldwide for their passion about tea. In 1662, when Princess Catherine from Portuguese married King Charles, she brought several crates of Chinese black tea as a dowry. That introduced black tea to the British palace, and since that time it has been an indispensable part of the life of the British royalty. Supposedly, and quite likely, the first thing to the British queen does every day is drink a cup of black tea. So tea was introduced from Portugal. I wonder who first brought the tea to Europe? Though traders must have long carried tales of tea and even tea samples from China and Japan to Europe, a Portuguese Jesuit missionary, Jasper de Cruz, was the first person to document his experience of making and drinking the stuff. That was in 1560, but it was a Dutch who introduced the beverage commercially to Europe. The Dutch only introduced green tea, not black tea. The Jesuits introduced black tea. Portugal was the first to introduce the practice of drinking tea to Europe, as well as the first European country to produce the tea. And the Queen brought black tea to the Reformation country to destroy the discernment of God's people. The devil is using the stuff, and we think the spirit of prophecy is silly and outdated, and should be relegated to the scrap heap of history, and people write books in this day and age and relegate her to a white elephant? Now, Jesuit theater and vice. Lexus News. Coffee culture frequently shows up in comics, television, movies, variety of ways. TV shows such as NCIS, show characters constantly with espresso in their hand, or people distributing takeout cups to other characters. The comic strips, Adam and Pearls before Swine, frequently center the strip around visiting or working at coffee shops. Daily Mail writer Philip Nolan stated that the spread of the coffee culture in Ireland is largely a credit to American television shows like Friends and Frasier saying, we saw it reflected in the lifestyle of our TV, etc. Jesuit theater. Who is poisoning the minds of people? Cowboys smoking, people drinking coffee. Today it's snorting drugs. I wonder who wants to introduce drugs to the world. I wonder who wants to introduce cocaine to the world as the drugs get worse and worse and worse to destroy the mind so that you cannot distinguish between right and wrong. Yes, it starts with the one and it ends with the other. Lovely little chocolate, theobromine. 18th century chocolate house, when chocolate was, finally reached England in 1650. 
Isn't that fascinating? Again, reformation, drug. Does Satan want to play with the minds of the people? It's interesting that the spirit of prophecy doesn't even write about chocolate. There's one statement, and a little bit perhaps about cocoa, of which it was made, because chocolate wasn't even manufactured at that stage yet. 1650, it was a drink reserved for the wealthy due to the high import duties on the cocoa beans. It became very popular at the King Charles II court, and gradually it became more freely available. The first London chocolate house was opened in 1657 by a Frenchman who produced the first advertisement for the chocolate drink to be seen in London. 1544, let's step back a bit. Dominican friars get into the swing. Dominican friars bring a delegation of Mayans to meet Philip, Spanish monks, who had been consigned to process the cocoa beans, finally let the secret out. It did not take a long before chocolate was acclaimed throughout Europe as a delicious health-giving food. The beans were still used as a currency. 200 beans bought a turkey cock. 100 beans was the daily wage of a porter and would buy a hen turkey or a rabbit. The price has really escalated in 30 years. Three beans could be traded for a turkey egg, a new avocado or a fish wrapped in maize husks. One bean bought a ripe, a ripe avocado, tomato or tamale. 1569, the Roman church takes a serious look at chocolate. Coco encountered a religious hurdle in 1591 over the thorny question of whether or not the consumption of the beverage broke the Lenten fast. Lent, the period of the liturgical year, leading up to Easter, time of prayer, etc., etc., time of self-denial. The Jesuits, who traded in chocolate, took a clearly practical position contending that the ambrosial and economically profitable drink most certainly did not break the fast. Let's continue. Before Pope Gregory, who declared that drinking cocoa did not break the fast, score one for the Jesuits and for the commerce of cocoa. Just as with coffee previously, cocoa advanced with papal approval. Who brought cocoa to the Western world? The Jesuits. Choice. Either the spirit of prophecy is right, or the Jesuits are right. Because they say exactly the opposite. They cannot be more contradictory. So which one do we want to believe? Pius, who did not like chocolate, declared that drinking chocolate on Friday did not break the fast. By 1828, the cocoa press is invented. Now listen to this, this is fascinating to me. 1830, the drink becomes a confection. 1847, the first fondant chocolate is produced. 1849, Cadbury exhibit chocolate. Who controlled the market of the cocoa beans? The Jesuits. They controlled it. They introduced it. And then they made it palatable so that everybody would start eating it. Is this a battle for the mind, yes or no? And why is the timing so perfect? Why are these things introduced in their primitive form in the time of the Reformation? And when it comes to the final choice of the gathering, they're there in their heyday and their perfection. 1851 comes to the Americans. 1875, milk chocolate is developed. 1879, chocolate melts in the mouth, and by 1900, the story is history, and, and Switzerland leads the world in chocolate. I wish we were all health reformers, councils on diet and food. I'm opposed to the use of pastries. Oops, I'm getting worse. I told you I'll be in trouble. These mixtures are unhealthful. No one can have good digestive powers and clear brain who will eat largely of sweet cookies, cream cake, and all kinds of pies. Don't we love to go to restaurants and gobble down big plates of cake during our meals or after our meals? Why? Is this God's food or is it the devil's food? 
What does this mixture of milk and sugar do to the mind? Did we study it in the previous lecture? What it, how it affects your mental capacity? I'm not going to go into the details. Let's just go back to it. Sweet cookies, cream cake, all kinds of pies and partake of a great variety of food at one meal. When we do this and then take cold, the whole system is so clogged and enfeebled that it has no power of resistance, no strength to combat disease. I would prefer a meat diet to the sweet cakes and pastries so generally used. So some Adventists think, well, I don't eat meat, but I'm going to surely con consume vast amounts of cake and pastries. would be better to eat meat in terms of your discernment. That's what the Spirit of Prophecy says. That health reformers remember that they may do more harm by publishing recipes which do not recommend health reform. Great care is to be shown in furnishing recipes for custards and pastry. If for dessert sweet cake is eaten with milk or cream, fermented will, fermentation will be created in the stomach and when the weak points of the human organism will tell the story, will break out in other diseases your vascular system will become polluted, but the most important thing, your brain will be affected by this disturbance in your stomach. You will not be able to discern between right and wrong. Now, does God give us all of this information in the spirit of prophecy to beat us over the head or to protect us? Absolutely. Who's in control of the industry that is destroying humanity today? Is it God's people or is it the devil's people? It's not difficult to discern. The Protestant world said there is the Antichrist. We've seen all of them introducing all of these things into the world. I frequently sit down to table of the brethren and sisters and see that they use great amounts of milk and sugar. These clog the system, irritate the digestive organs and affect the brain. This is the issue. We should eat fruits, grains, nuts, seeds, and vegetables, baked good bread made from unbolted, wholesome, full grain, and we would have discernment in our minds. If we don't, we lose it. This comes from Coca-Cola itself. How much sugar is there inside a two-liter can of Coke? Coca-Cola contains 10.6 grams of sugar per 100 milliliters. So that's 35 grams in 330 milliliter can, equivalent to 7 teaspoons. And 26.5 in a 250 milliliter can, that's 5.5 teaspoons. Coca-Cola is these days sweetened with corn syrup. Makes it even worse. So now you have a substance that goes straight into your brain. Now I showed this one in the last lecture, but just for continuity, I'll show it again. Does Coca-Cola contain cocaine? The answer is it had to be extracted, but this webpage says Coke wouldn't become completely cocaine-free till 1929, when the law prohibited it. When scientists preferred the process of removing all psychoactive elements from coca leaf extract. Now I wonder who controls the coca leaf extract and the coca leaf industry. Will it be the spirit of prophecy or will it be the Jesuits? While the modern day recipe for Coca-Cola is a highly prized company secret, there is reason to believe that the beverage still contains some non-narcotic cocoa leaf extract that it did in 1929. When they take the sugar out, they used to replace it with saccharine. And saccharine was found to be highly carcinogenic, so they were forbidden to do that. So now they use aspartame, which is a mind-altering drug. So this is, excuse me, the devil's drink. Now, let's go back to Freud's magical drug, cocoa, in other words, cocaine. The church notwithstanding, Spanish leaders realized that coca was a necessary tool and an incentive to work in the thin Andean air of the high mountains, and in 1569, King Philip II decreed that cocoa 
Coca was not devilish. Spain needed labor to mine gold, silver, and gemstones. Productivity had been low and death common for those working in the mines. In 1570, Spain had imposed the heavy resident tax payable on Spanish coin, and to make this coinage, the Indians, already enslaved, were first forced to work harder on short rations for long hours. Who ran these so-called reductions, these forced labor camps? The Jesuits. The Jesuits ran them. Okay, so they were forced to work long hours at a stretch, and uh, they were given cocoa leaves three or four times per day, and this was able to improve production, and bullion flowed from the mines for developing of the Spanish Armada. And what was the Spanish Armada going to be used for? Wasn't it to destroy Protestantism? So the cocoa trade was used for the Spanish Armada. A male Indian with cocoa leaves would carry 150 pounds, five kilometers in 45 minutes, and could walk up a steep mountain 15,000 feet high at the rate of 2.5 kilometers per hour. In one of the great turnabouts of history, the Jesuits claimed that the devil's cocoa would now be used to assist God's work. Where did cocaine come from? From the Jesuits. Who introduced it? The Jesuits. Take your choice again. Either the spirit of prophecy is insane or it is spot on. Unfortunately, 90% of the mine workers never lived out their five months tenure because they all died. Satan doesn't care if he destroys a mine. Now let's have a look at the companies that control the modern industries to pervert our food, to produce poisonous chemicals into the world, and to destroy the minds and the lives of God's people today. Here's a web page which speaks about the complete history of Monsanto, the world's most evil corporation. Interesting. This is the founder. He looks incredibly congenial. 1901, the company is founded by John Francis Quina, a member of the Knights of Malta. The Knights of Malta are controlled by whom? By the Jesuits. This is a Jesuit company, in other words. Founded by Jesuit-controlled individuals. And what is the first thing they introduce? They produce saccharin and they give it to Coca-Cola. Are these companies in cahoots, yes or no? Yes, they're in cahoots. Even then, the government knew saccharine was poisonous and sued to stop its manufacture, but lost in court, thus opening to Mon the Monsanto Pandora's box to begin poisoning the world through the soft drink. Since then, it has introduced PCBs, which is killing thousands of people. Since then, it has produced many other chemicals, in 1920, Monsanto expands into the industrial chemicals and drugs, becoming the world's fast largest maker of aspirin. This also at the time when things began to go horribly wrong for the planet in a hurry. So they produced PCBs, and uh, they were used as lubricants, etc., etc., and uh, caused fetal death and immature birth in the States. By 1930, they created the first hybrid corn and expand into detergent, soap, industrial cleaning. By 1940, they begin research on re uranium to be used for the Manhattan Project and the first atomic bomb. These people want to destroy mankind, not uplift mankind. If you want to study the health industry, you will find the fingerprint of God on the one hand, and you will find the fingerprint of the devil on the other hand. And it is up to mankind to choose whether they want to follow the one or the other. By 1950, they become closely associated with Walt Disney Company. And if you look at uh, the subliminals and the movies, then the rest is basically history. And they erect the House of Future there, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have to go into the details. And if we want to finalize the story, here is a new publication that has come out. There is the webpage, Guns, Drugs, and Sex, 
the Jesuits' worldwide network, network that generates a trillion dollars a year. What does it say about it? The following excerpt is from Sean McLaren's upcoming book, Romanic Depression, how the deadliest of the black pope and Jesuit militia distort the history of the United States of America. And it's coming, published, it was published this year. The three biggest illegal money makers on the planet, guns and ammo, drugs and the human trafficking. Gun running, drugs and sex trafficking exist wherever the Jesuits already have or wish to have political and or social discord. They are as organized as any transnational corporation with Jesuit priests at the highest level of management and are dressed down to look streetwise and cool. They have their own brand of underground advertising, marketing and PR, some of which is directed by experts in those areas. So while it is advertised as illegal across the globe, it behaves as a legitimate business. This is what the media says. Who is out to control your mind? Whether it be with coffee, tea, cocoa products, drugs, or any one of these other terrible isms, or manipulating the food chain. Secure for yourselves land where you can grow your own vegetables. Because these things are all being manipulated, but you'll still be better off eating plants than you will be eating animal products. God requires of his people continual advancement. We need to learn that indulged appetite is the greatest hindrance to mental improvement and soul sanctification. With all our profession of health reform, many of us eat improperly. Indulgence of appetite is the greatest cause of physical and mental debility and lies largely at the foundation of feebleness and premature death. Let the individual who is seeking to possess purity of spirit bear in mind that in Christ there is power to control the appetite. I would like to make an appeal to people not to disregard the spirit of prophecy and not to be drawn into this debate as to its validity or non-validity in this time in which we are living, when these people who have no discernment whatsoever use statements that I have used tonight to prove its invalidity. When you can see clearly by contrast between what the Antichrist is doing and what God's people should be doing, that I'd rather be on the Lord's side. And therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Amen. Amen.